Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the November 5th, 2010 edition of the uh, RASC Ottawa Centre's uh, monthly meeting. Tonight, we've got a pretty full program for you. We'll try to move it along as quickly as we can, but uh, lots and lots of stuff for you to look at. So I think uh, without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll start out by setting the mood a bit. Next, please. Lovely, huh? Really nice job. Uh, Jennifer West, an RESC member, uh, one of the other centers. Um, it's kind of a, a topic that's close to our heart, uh, you know, the dark sky, preserving the dark sky, that sort of thing. And as is pointed out in this message, uh, there's, uh, there's probably a little bit that each of us can do. Next, please, Attila. Um, just recently, uh, uh, this has been noticed in one of our uh, local stores around here. Uh, I believe it was Home Depot. Uh, uh, an example of a, a good style of lighting uh, doesn't project a lot of light elsewhere than where you want it put at a pretty reasonable price on it too, uh, about 25 bucks. Um, this picture was sent in uh, this month. And I got a look at it and started thinking, gee, I've got a front porch light that, uh, you know, isn't exactly uh, dark sky friendly. So uh, I did my bit. Ha-ha. There we go. I got this one down at... Uh, Home Depot today. It was a little over 50, but it's got fancy, you know, uh, uh, motion sensing, so it turns off when it's not needed, and it's also got a light sensor, so when the sun's up, it doesn't come on either. So a few more features in this one, but uh, approved. Nice little unit. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, putting it up a little later this weekend. Pardon me. <laughs> All righty. Next, please, Attila. So our program for tonight, uh, we're going to start off with observations, like to mix up the program a little bit from time to time. So rather than waiting till later in the program, we'll do them right at the beginning. Followed by Sanjeev is going to talk to us about portable astrophotography. Uh, Sanjeev is quite recognized in the center these days for doing some very good work. Uh, followed by Joe Silverman uh, talking about uh, paying attention to detail as uh, having to do with our uh, scopes, our collimation, the rest. And I'll let him talk to you about that. We'll be doing the break, followed by Al Scott with a 10-minute astronomy news update. Richard Alexandrovich will be talking to us about the Kepler mission. Rob Dick will be telling us about uh, center business and in particular uh, at the national level, uh, 
what's going on there. And Mike Mogadam with uh, a fill-in on public outreach and what we've been doing. They've been very active. So I think without further ado, we'll jump right into the observation reports and starting off with Paul Commission. And is Paul in the front as usual? Right you are. Do you need the mic? No, I don't think so. All right. <laughs> Good man. Okay, next please. Okay, this is NGC 7008. It's a planetary that's in Cygnus. Uh, it's about 13th magnitude. Easily seen in a small scope. I took that uh, back last year. Uh, as you can see, it's in a fairly good star field there, as Cygnus is quite full of stars. And uh, it's a five minute exposure with two by two binning. Next. Okay, I took this one just recently. Uh, this is Vandenberg 1. It's a reflection nebula. This is in Cassiopeia. Uh, it's quite bright in, in a sense, but uh, I hear from Glenn here next door that there's a, uh, an open cluster associated with it, Glenn? Yeah. So Where is that cluster? I don't see it. Those three bright stars that are illuminating the dust cloud surrounding them. The, those, those are the... Uh, the uh, the, uh, yep. These right here? All there. Yep, they're all ah. related to each other. Right, okay. okay. This is a five minute exposure, two by two, and my scope is a uh, uh, Mead uh, 14 inch LX 200, <laughs> uh, and uh, the uh, camera is an SD10 XME. What's, what's the ring, uh, Paul? I don't know. That one is, that's, that's something that, it, I noticed that too, but I don't know. It looks like some kind of a planetary type of thing, but I haven't, I, I'm getting that Polish atlas tonight, so I'm going to try to look it up and see what it is. I don't know, the atlas is don't show. All right, let us know when you find out. I will. Okay, next please, Attila. Uh, next, Ron, Ron Alexander, are you Rob. here? Rob, sorry, oops, oops misspelled on there. <laughs> I should have known. Oh, you're Rob Alexander. You're not Ron Alexander. Do you need the laser? No. No, okay. <laughs> in case anyone's in doubt, that would be the Orion Nebula. Um, it's probably the most f f photographed thing in the night sky, perhaps after the moon. Um, I'm very new to, to astrophotography, and... Uh, so this is one of my first shots. This is my f first attempt at shooting Orion. This was on last Tuesday night when we had such spectacular sky conditions, absolutely still air and highly transparent. Um, and I took about a half a dozen shots, and this is the one I think is the best of, of those. Um, it's j j just through my Lievenich. Celestron with a focal reducer to take it down to f6.3. It's uh, Canon Rebel XT with the uh, with the Bader f filter mod for astronomy. A little thing I got on Astromart, and uh, this was just on the scope, th 30 seconds unguided. <laughs> it's just uh, a fairly good polar alignment, but not perfect, and. Uh, that's it. It's just raw right out of the camera. It's not re retouched. It's not stacked or anything. That's just the plain E image. But I think that Orion is just one of the most beautiful things in the sky. So it's always w w worth a shot. There's a nice 3D effect on that, uh, Rob, that you don't always see in shots of uh, 42 like that. Yeah, the uh, darker nebula in the center does appear to be closer, doesn't it? Yeah. What type of mount are you using? Um, it's the standard fork the yoke mount for the Celestron CPC-11. Uh, so it's an Altaz mount, but it's on a wedge. So it's on the equatorial wedge. There you go. Thank you. Next up, uh, Gordon Webster. The Gordon here? Yep. Good. Here he comes. <clears throat> Well, first thing I have to say is, Chris, I really like your beard. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, as you probably figured out, that's Comet uh, Hartley 2. Uh, it was done October 1st. It was up in Cassiopeia. 
And then we have a second one, which was done on October 8th, when it was down just past, I missed it when it was a little closer to the, uh, the double cluster. Uh, since then, I've seen the comet twice. Uh, both times we were at the FLO. Um, first time was on the night of uh, October 10th, and the skies were really nasty. We got out there, and half the sky was clouds, and half the sky was marvelous. And so we set everything up, and it clouded over. So we puttered around and you know, looked at some sucker holes for a bit, and then it totally clouded over. And we waited, and we waited, and then we put everything away. And by the time when we looked up from putting everything away, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. <laughs> so we played with the binoculars for a while. And uh, with the binoculars, we picked up Hartley again, and it was, uh, you could detect a green tint to it. And then Tuesday night, it was out there again. And in the 200 mil daub, we picked it up. And it had that round shape that you're familiar with if you've seen any photos of it. And then the next sketch is Crescendi. That's a walled plane. A wall, yeah, a walled plane on the, on the moon, obviously. Uh, it's uh, uh, the crater at the top of the rim that's breaking the, the walls. That's uh, Crescendi A, 33 kilometers in diameter. Uh, the thing I found interesting about it was the double, the double peaks. And the other thing I noticed is that large blue spruce trees really soften the features on the moon when you're trying to sketch them. <laughs> so I didn't get to any of the any more detail on the crater floor. So, and then I said, did you get the photo as well? Uh, did you throw it in I or not? I already used it. <laughs> oh, you already used it? Yep, the Rona the one? Yep. Okay, right, yeah. that's it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Gloria. <laughs> Next up, Wayne Ross. I was out on the 7th out of Moose Creek and surprisingly enough, I think it was myself and one other person doing video astronomy <clears throat> and the clouds were these waves of clouds coming in and uh, just very narrow bands but Montreal was doing a remarkable job of reflecting light off of it so this is a one, this is just a single image it's a 10 minute exposure at the end of uh, I was trying to do an, um, this imaging of Andromeda and uh, so you can see the streak where Hartley's moving and I just took it at the last second, thought it would make a, a nice capture. But I since learned um, that uh, the double cluster, as you know, some of you may know, is moving towards us at about 23 uh, kilometers per second. Hartley's moving at about 22 kilometers per second. And the two objects are, are all moving at the same speed. Now one, hopefully, is not coming towards us at all. And uh, absolutely uh, fun. So this was uh, taken when Hartley was only 23 million uh, miles away from Earth. On its, uh, on its travel around the sun. And yesterday, I don't know if anybody saw the pictures from Epoxy. I was hoping, I actually thought to send them in, but it was uh, obviously too late. But it's about a, a couple of kilometers across, but it looks like a peanut. And the middle of it looks like it's been shaved, almost like it's a smooth patch in the center of it. And it's uh, quite remarkable. If you have a chance to go on the Epoxy website and take a look, uh, the pictures are just absolutely remarkable. And just uh, one last thing, I uh, had a chance to submit this. Uh, there's a website uh, related to the Epoxy mission for amateur astronomers to submit um, images and uh, light curves and any other data that you may have for uh, Ceres, uh, Vesta, and uh, Hartley. And the, the, the folks who are working on the mission are putting this together with different folks from around the world. So what you get is a, a series of images that cover the, the visible span, if you will, uh, for Hartley or any of these other objects. And uh, so there you go. What's, what's, what were you using? Oh, yeah, I should tell you. Um, <clears throat> to get the, the nice wide field, I'm actually using my ED80, uh, apochromatic, and it is guided. And I'm uh, just using my Rebel X XS, and there's nothing to it other than the fact that I ran this through a noise filter afterwards, because obviously 10-minute exposure kind of picks, it builds up a bit of noise in there. The only thing I wish that, that uh, built up a bit more, if it wasn't focusing so much on the comet, was the, the beautiful orange stars that you get around the cluster. It's, it's, it's quite nice. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, I saw this picture uh, in a magazine or on the web, and I thought, this would be an awesome thing to image. It's uh, like it even looks like a heart to me. And Gendler's a pretty good astrophotographer, and he's not 
he's somebody that I sort of, uh, as, as a sort of a hero figure. All right, the next one. This is my image of it. And you can see it doesn't look anything like Gendler's at all. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, th this is a faint nebula. You don't really see it in individual frames. And I only saw this after I processed it. And I was wondering what on earth happened. Uh, so could you show me the next one? It's because I wasn't paying attention to the field of view. And the black square is mine. Uh, there's a bit more to it. Uh, I'm using a fairly high magnification scope, which uh, uh, I, I will try this again some other time with a wider angle. Or I could do the 80 frames that would require to cover the whole thing. <laughs> okay, the next one. Uh, IC342 is uh, it's right, it lies right in the galactic plane. Um, it, uh, it's uh, just east of uh, Perseus, and uh, it, you're, because of that, you're looking through an awful lot of dust, and it's a very, very faint uh, 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 galaxy. And uh, it turned out actually better than I thought it would. This is, a, this is probably five or six hours of exposure. What scope are you using? Well, I was using a Cervolo uh, prototype. Uh, so it's an 11-inch F5. Okay, next one. Um, this uh, uh, IC410 um, is about uh, 12,000 light years away, and it's a mission. Uh, and uh, one of the things is, you see these streamers here, right in there? They think that those are star-forming areas. And uh, the, the, the red color is just the light being, uh, the hydrogen gas being lit up by the ultraviolet from the nearby stars. Okay, next one. Uh, IC 1985. Uh, interesting, you know, after when I take an image, I, I sort of know a little bit about it. Then I go on the net and I typed in IC 1985. And I want to tell you, if you're looking for something, don't type in a date. Uh, <laughs> I got like 7,000 hits and two of them were astronomical. And more than that were pornography. <laughs> Um, this is called the Cyclops, and it's a kind of an interesting area. I, I personally really like uh, blue, uh, the blue that shows up in a lot of these. This is dust that's being, the, the, the light is being reflected off of it. And this has got about 300 stars in it. Um, it the, the image is, uh, this in my image is about two light years across, and the whole thing is about 10 light years across. So this is only a small part of the middle of it. But there's about 300 stars in this thing, and about one third of them have a thick, uh, uh, circumstellar disk, uh, sort of, and, and uh, they're, they, they're uh, studying these to help them understand how th planets form. And the stars are all pretty young. They're about two and a half million uh, years old. Uh, you know, considering that we're like five billion or so years old, our sun, this is, these are pretty, uh, pretty young stars. And a pretty picture, I think. Um, this is uh, my ode to Brian. Uh, uh, just... Um, I, I see the moon and it irritates me, so, uh, <laughs> so I image it every once in a while. This is actually a mosaic of six frames uh, to give you some kind of idea of what the, the field of view of my scope. And actually, because it is a mosaic, this image doesn't show it because it's been reduced for the, for the screen, but there's quite a bit of detail showing in each of these. So, so each frame would be, you know, about that big. Nice yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, you get... When you have a small imager, that's what happens. You get good at stitching. OK, the next one. Here's Comet Hartley. Uh, this was taken just as it was heading toward the double cluster on the October 7th to the, over the night of the 8th. And uh, it's a one and a half hour exposure. Uh, and each image is about 60 seconds long. And so you look at this, and you know that this thing is moving. And so how did I get, uh, you know, a, the stars all around and the, and, the, and the comet pretty good. Well, I used an a imaging trick. Uh, what I did was I imaged on, uh, I, I added up the 90 frames or so, uh, f centering up on a star, whatever star I chose. And then so all the images were lined up on the stars. You end up with this big blurry comet going across because it's moved over this period of time. And then I added the frames up using a median, a median combine. And since the comet isn't in very many of them, uh, it gets canceled out. So I end up with just a nice picture of the stars. And then I do the opposite. I center up just on the comet. And the stars are streaks across the sky, and they get canceled out. And then I combine the two of them. And I end up with a picture of the comet 
and the uh, the stars, which is all nice and sharp. Uh, yeah, no, actually, I was using Maxim. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the first time I did this, by the way, I started with the comet here and and then it went right off the frame. So that wasn't so useful. Then I looked at this and I thought to myself, hey, wait a second, I got all these frames. Why don't I put them together in a movie? And uh, not knowing how to do this, not having the faintest clue how to do this, I actually used a program which is totally uh, not suited for this called Maxim and uh, put, made all these frames. It took me two hours to add, get these frames all registered and together uh, and for about a 12 second movie. It was a pathetic sort of return on my effort. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, this is this. The headlines are part of the Windows Movie Maker. I think that's worth two hours. As long as it's his two hours. That's right. <laughs> See the stuff down here, the garbage down here. <laughs> I didn't get rid of. It's pretty cool, Bob. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I'm liking it. Yep. Uh, Paul Hi again, everybody. Well, I guess we all had our sights on uh, Hartley on the few days of uh, clear weather we had while it was uh, putting on a show. This is uh, this is one I took October the second uh, when it was uh, uh, starting to get uh, a little bit bigger in our sky, and uh, actually uh, Space Weather published this on their main page. Uh, I think it was October the eighth or something like that. Um, so you can see the relative size of the uh, of the comet versus the moon on that day. And uh, if we can show the next one, um, that. Uh, that was uh, that. That's just a close-up of the comet itself. This is a very short exposure, uh, only only about 90 seconds, a single exposure. Uh, next one, please. Uh, night of the double cluster. We were all out that night because it was uh, it was a beautiful night there. Uh, that was a two and a half minute exposure, and uh, the cluster uh, with uh, with some of its uh, yellow stars uh, actually showed up quite nice. Next one, please. I uh, also wanted to to bag it on the night of closest approach to Earth, which was October the 20th. And uh, dismal weather we had at that time, but we had a one hour window. I don't know, I think some of you uh, may have been out at that time. There was, a, there was a window of opportunity from about five in the morning till six in the morning. And uh, clouds on one side of that window, daylight on the other side of that window. But it did manage to, to get out and, uh, and grab it when it was nice and close, because that, uh, that was at the time at that uh, it was at its biggest. And at that point in time, it was about uh, Three quarters the size of the of the moon, so uh, that was uh, that was the last shot I took of it. Now the next shot is one we were talking about. This was from yesterday morning. The epoxy spacecraft flew to within 700 kilometers of that nucleus, and uh, just spectacular image. This is uh, this is the fifth comet that we've flown a spacecraft very close by, and uh, it's by far the smallest. That that nucleus is only about two kilometers across from end to end. So, I mean, it's big enough, uh, but uh, as comets go, it's uh, it's a, it's a fairly small nucleus, but very very active. You can see on the on the on the. Uh, as, uh, as, as, as was already described, it looks like a roughly the shape of a peanut, and both ends are very rough. And there's this uh, surprisingly smooth center neck uh, that, uh, that uh, is, is obviously quite different from the, from the other surrounding terrain. But most of the active outgassing, the jets, seem to be forming from uh, the rough terrain that is on, on either end of this bird. So uh, yeah, uh, that's a ringside seat, a little closer than the 13 million miles we had. That's what I got for you tonight. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next up, we have uh, Sanjeev uh, going to talk to us about astrophotography. Sanjeev, welcome. Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, Bill. I feel like my voice. I've uh, got a bit of a cough. Um, so I've given a couple of these talks before, and what I thought I'd do today, because uh, previously I've talked about how I do my setup, etc., um, is just talk a bit about adding variety and some versatility. And by that, what I mean is, by variety, I mean with a variety of the type of shots that we do. Um, and by versatility, I mean the methods that we use, um, because our, our sky time is quite limited, given the, the weather we have uh, in Ottawa. But I think that by adapting to different situations, we can increase the range of the types of uh, opportunities that we have to shoot pictures. Um, and now the photos I'm going to show you are well, all done. I took them all over the last three months, so August, September, October. And um, 
they were all done in Ontario under dark skies. So <coughs> the furthest I went for the photos was to Nirvana, which is about two hours west of here, to pristine dark skies um, near Barnacle Provincial Park. And then uh, I did some of them in Yarn Prior, which is also under dark skies. And some I did at FLO, the Fred Lawson Observatory. Um, um, and some you'll see I've done under, under moonlit conditions and some under moonless conditions. Next, please. So um, what are the ways to add variety and versatility? Next. OK. Uh, one is to use different focal lengths. Now, um, the, the, long, the biggest aperture that I use is five and, five and a half inches because I try to keep things portable uh, because I don't have an observatory. So I have to carry my stuff to, to dark skies. Next. We can also actually change our sh uh, the size of our chip and, and the shape of our chip. Now, people are familiar with cropping an image. Um, but we can also do mosaics, and by mo in a mosaic, we're actually taking our chip and we're making taking several pictures uh, of different parts of the sky and then stitching them together. And in both those situations, we can actually change effectively the shape of the chip that we're using. We can make it into a, like a, a square shape. We can, you know, by putting it in, you can line up your chip in portrait formation or in landscape formation, and the, the, depending on how you do it, you get you get a different kind of shape to work with and different compositions that you can that you can build with that. Next. Also, I think that um, it's important to use both the DSLR and the CCD. And by CCD here, I'm talking about the monochrome CCD with uh, a, f a color filter wheel, so that well, I'm, not, I'm not talking about a one-shot color CCD. Because I think that a, a DSLR being a one-shot camera, um, because it takes color pictures with just a single exposure, I think complements very well a CCD, especially under our climate, because often you don't have the time to take you know, exposures through three different filters or four or five different filters. So in those situations, the DSLR comes in very, very handy because you know you can get, with at least with four frames, you can make a picture, a full, a full color picture. Next. I think it also helps if you can combine narrowband uh, data, like H-alpha data, with RGB. And that help, can help bring out faint nebulosity and add uh, contrast to your image. Next. Um, and also, let's not forget that you can do unguided imaging. So we don't actually have to guide our, our equatorial mount for, for all of our shooting. There's lots of pictures we can take without guiding. And in fact, there's also lots of pictures we can take without even tracking, with just a simple tripod. I'll show you one photo like that as well. Next. Um, and then there's also moonlit versus moonless skies. I think that I personally prefer moonless night. I mean, I think that if I'm going to do anything with, in color, I prefer to go to a dark side where there's no moon. But you can do uh, photos under moonlit conditions as well, especially if you're using narrowband. Next. And always, uh, my golden rule is keep it simple and portable, because ultimately you want to be able to enjoy what you're doing and also make it you know, actually workable. Next. So here's um, this is a shot of my, my portable setup that I use. Um, th th this shot I did at FLO. Now, that's the observat observatory over there, and this is the, um, the warm room. So typically, when I'm out, I'm not see I don't have these buildings there, and I use my van. Um, as my warm room when I get cold. And I, I typically set up like this. this is my mount, and there's a small refractor on top there, right? On this, this picture, it's my 85 millimeter refractor. And there's cables going in to the, to the van. And um, I don't know if you can see Orion up here. So this is Orion rising in the east, and this picture was taken in August. So can you guess what time it is? It's, it's about 4 a.m. And also, if you look at the grass, it looks really green. Um, and it looks almost like it's daytime, right? But actually, it's, it's because there's a very bright moon overhead. You can see the shadow here. And so what I was doing here under these moonlit conditions is I was, um, I was shooting uh, the Veil Nebula through an H-alpha filter. Um, and, and this shot is a 15-second exposure on a tripod. So that's why you're seeing so much light. It's not, it's not from a flash or anything like that. There's no flash used here. Next, please. OK, so this is the first picture that I'm going to show you uh, in terms of astral images. Um, I, I shot Comet Hartley from Acre Campground, Algonquin Park, with my, my little refractor. And then I realized the Comet, there wasn't really much to the Comet in terms of what we can see with our instruments. I mean, we don't have a, a NASA probe that can go 700 kilometers close to the Comet. So it, the comet is in this picture is right over here, right? Now, it wasn't, as a, as a target in its, own, in its own right, it wasn't that interesting. So 
I thought if, he, if the comet is interesting, well, at least what might be interesting is the travels of the comet, right? So this comet was traveling past the double cluster. This shot I did on October 9th from Nirvana. And, and over those few, those few days, it had gone kind of from like around here, I think, up here. And it was actually passing through a very nice area of sky. And there wasn't just a double cluster here. Up here is the heart nebula. And here is the Sol Nebula. This thing looks like a fetus, and that's why it's called the Sol Nebula. I think that's IC 1805, and that might be 1848, if I remember correctly. But this, this, amount of, this is a large amount of sky. It's 8 degrees by 8 degrees. So to get here, I had to use a 135 millimeter lens, and I did a two-panel mosaic. So I shot uh, one panel included this area here, and the other one included this area here. And, and each side is about 32 minutes. So you can see a streak in the nucleus. So that's about 33 minutes worth of streaking as it's traveling in the direction of the star. This is Eta Percy, the star. So um, now my point is with this picture is just that, you know, it, it, there are different things we can show in a picture. One is we can show the comet, but we can also show, you know, the overall context in which the, we see the comet. Next, please. Okay, this is a panel of uh, a mosaic of the Milky Way. And this also I shot in August at Nirvana. And um, the, the amount of sky we're seeing here is huge because we're going from, it's a two-panel mosaic. From the horizon up there, it's about 135 degrees. So we're seeing well past the zenith, all right? So this star up here is Deneb, and this star here is Vega, and that's Altair, so that's the summer triangle. And if you can see the North American Nebula up there. And down here, this, uh, this dark horse here, this is the Pipe Nebula. And that's the uh, that's M8, the lagoon. So again, with this picture, what I was trying to do was to show the galaxy as an edge on, right? And I think that we're looking at, I think it's pretty clear we're looking at half of an edge on galaxy because that's the central bulge and it's setting below the horizon. Now to do this kind of shot, you need the galaxy to be vertical, right? And that happens at about 11 p.m. to midnight in August, where the arc of the Milky Way is overhead, with Sagittarius, which is right over here, being still above the horizon. It also happens around 10 o'clock in September or around 8.30 8 p.m. in October. So there's actually you know, several different opportunities to take this kind of a picture. Because if you, if you take it at other times, and the Milky Way is kind of not, not straight overhead, the picture, the galaxy will be going sideways. Okay, okay next, please. So here's the lagoon area, and we're just going, uh, sort of zooming in. And this is with the 135 millimeter lens. Okay, again, by using a different focal lens, we can have we can have different fields of view. And this is just 40 minutes with the DSLR. It's 10 shots, four four minutes each. And I shot this at Nirvana as well. And you can see up here is M22. It's a big globular cluster. There's the lagoon nebula. There's the Triffid nebula, and there's M21 up here as an open cluster. This small fudge here, fuzzy thing here is M28, another globular. And this star is the, the topmost star, like in the, the top of the teapot of Sagittarius. Um, next, please. OK, so now we're getting a closer view of, of the lagoon. So I'd like you to go, can you go back and forth once or twice? Go back. OK, this is not, OK, no, that's too fast. <laughs> OK, <coughs> this is a 9 degree field that I get. This is on my Canon 40D, OK? It's a filter modified camera. And by the way, I realized after like, looking at this picture for, for, for a few weeks, I realized that my color balance is off here. It's too much yellow. And I, I didn't realize it until about a month after I, I did this. Anyways, can, can you go back to the other one? OK, this is 1 degree. Same camera. All we've changed is the focal length, right? So in both cases, there's about 3,500 pixels going across, right, the image. So what's happening is the image scale, each pixel in the first picture is showing about nine arc seconds of sky. In this picture, each pixel is showing us about one arc second of sky. So the image scale is different. And of course, you know, the field of view is smaller as well. But I think it's, it, it might sound beside the point, but I think it's important to think about that kind of stuff. And you're, and you're trying to decide, well, how much detail do you really want to show in your picture? Right? The previous picture was more about composition and showing context. This picture is more about trying to show detail. Okay, next please. So that was a 72 minute picture. This is a seven and a half hour picture. 
Now this picture I shot with my CCD camera. And it's the M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. Um, now what I was trying to do here, the Dumbbell, see, when you see the Dumbbell in small scopes to an eyepiece, we often see the apple core shape. And that's why it's called the Dumbbell Nebula. But if you look at, look at this through a 12-inch scope under dark skies, you're going to see the whole football shape of it at the eyepiece. And then if you look at it, if you look at it in, in photos, often, like in LRGB photos, you'll see this X shape in addition to the football shape. But what I was going after was really, I don't know if you can see this in this, but all around it, can, can you see that? It's an, that's the outer halo of M27. And to get that, what I had, I did, I did two and a half hours of exposures under dark skies, and then I did five hours of exposures at home from my backyard through an H-alpha filter, and I combined them. And that was how I tried to bring out the outer, the outer, uh, the outer halo. So again, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an LRGB with H-alpha in it as well. Okay, next please. Okay, this is um, M33, the triangular galaxy. Um, this one I did near on prior, uh, and, and all, this is also two nights of exposures, but, oh, go back please, okay. So, um, what I did here, and the reason I'm showing this is because this, in this picture I used H-alpha as well, but I only used 40 minutes of it, and um, the total exposure is four hours. I, I had 40 minutes of red, and I added 40 minutes of H-alpha into my red. And all I was trying to do with that is just to bring out these H2 regions in M33 and just make them a bit more punchy. And because M M33, I think, is a unique-looking galaxy because it... It always looks like it came out of a bar and it's got all these sores from a bar fight or something. <laughs> and, um, and it has this really raggedy kind of appearance. And, and so I think the, the, the HIH2 regions are sort of what give it its, its, sort, of, its the, the sort of the visual appearance that make it kind of uh, unique. Okay, next please. So this is the veil. Now, the, the first shot I showed you of, um, from FLO with my van, well, that, that's what I was doing there that night. It took me two nights. We had two clear nights in a row. The moon was out, so I thought I'll go do this. This is with my 85-millimeter uh, refractor. And what I did here was I wanted to shoot the whole veil, right? And now my field of view at 480 millimeters with my camera, I have the QSI 583. That's what I use with my camera. Um, it, my field of view is about 2 degrees by 1.6 degrees, 2.2 by 1.6, so it would give me about this much. So to do this, I had to do six panels. So there's three panels going this way and three panels coming back this way. And um, I think that the veil, the reason I want to do it that, do the whole veil is because to, to me the veil, there's something very eerie about the veil when you look at it even in the eyepiece. Um, and you have to remember that this is a star that exploded about 10,000 years ago. And this, we're seeing the remnants of that. So it, 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 there's always a bit of spookiness to it if, if, when I see it. And... I wanted to capture the whole loop. In fact, this is actually called the Cygnus Loop, right? That's the other name for the Veil, the veil Nebula. And <clears throat> I thought by capturing the whole loop that we'd get a sense of what this thing is. Now, this is often referred to as a waterfall. It's NGC uh, 6962, 6992. And this is the, it's the Eastern Veil, Western Veil, it's uh, 6960. Some people call this the Witch's Broom. And this is the Pickering's Wedge, or Pickering's triangular wisp, as it's sometimes called. That star, that's 52 Cygni. The star is um, not related to the nebula. It's a foreground star. <laughs> now, one thing you notice about the star field, one reason I did this in H-alpha is because the veil, when you go and shoot it um, through like uh, just a regular color image, the star, the star field around the veil, is th there's a lot of stars um, because it's in Cygnus. It's in a, in a rich part of the, the Milky Way there. And I think what happens is the stars overwhelm the nebula. But with the H-alpha filter, the, the spectrum that's coming through is very tiny. And especially with this filter, the three nanometer filters are only allowing a very tiny ba bandwidth to come through. So the stars are much more diminished, and that helps notice the, uh, the, the, the nebula more. Okay, next, please. Okay, this is the gamma Cygni region. Now, if you look at the Cygnus, the, the middle star in the cross is gamma Cygni, and that's the star right here. Am I out of time? Oh, no. <coughs> something else. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, 
So gamma cygni, right? Now, this is, I want to show you this picture because this is with my lens attached directly to my CCD camera, right? And you can do that if you have an adapter for it. But the trouble is that the lens, most lenses these days are not manual aperture lenses. They're automatic aperture lenses, so your camera is the one that controls the aperture. But, so I had to shoot this, basically it shoots it wide open. So I had to shoot this at f2. Um, and as a result, that star is a bit mangled, which really bugs me. But um, it's still adding a decent image. And here you can see NGC 6888. Uh, it's the Crescent Nebula. And the field here is about seven degrees wide. So there's a lot of nebulosity in, in, in Cygnus. Again, when I'm shooting at this focal length, I don't have to guide. And I, you know, it's just three minute subs I used. So I just took 45 subs to take this picture. Next, please. Okay, this is the last picture that I'm gonna show you tonight. Um, it's my last slide. The, um, this is a three panel mosaic. That I did. This is actually probably the most fun shot that I've done so far. Um, and it's with the 135mm lens again. Now you're looking at 14 degrees of sky. So can you go back for a second? Okay, see Gamma Cygni? Can you go back? Last slide? No, uh, sorry, next? Yeah, okay, there it is. So we're just, we've just kind of doubled the width of the field here. But this is with my DSLR and a dark skies. <coughs> and I wanted to try to bring out the, the Milky Way here and you know, the richness of the star fields. That star over there is Deneb, and that's Gamma Cygni, okay? That's the Pelican and North American Nebulae, and that's the Gamma Cygni Nebula, and the Crescent Nebula is out here somewhere. It's very faint. Um, so I think that the, if, you know, with this image, uh, well, the reason I, I enjoy, enjoy doing it is because you can actually, you can't capture this with as far as I know, a single, a single camera. I think it's, you know, you got to do, like, you have to be willing to do something like a, a mosaic to get it. And I think if you look at the exposure time, 96 minutes, well, that's because it's just 32 minutes per panel. So four minute subs, right? And then you stitch it together in Photoshop. Um, but I think it's, it's, uh, it goes to the, the thing about adding, you know, some variety and some versatility to, to what we shoot because in 96 minutes, Typically, we don't think of that as being enough to do a, a big picture, but actually it is, um, if, you know, depending on how we target um, our energy. Um, and I think I'd, I'd leave you with, um, with uh, a, a couple of analogies um, as by, by sort of conc conc concluding thoughts. One is that I think when I'm out shooting pictures, I often think of that it must be like people that go to catch fish because there's, there's a lot that, you know, in terms of knowing what se what, what's seasonal and what's not seasonal, right, to go out and catch. And then there's also, you got to also think about the equipment that you're using. You know, do you have the right size net, like the chip size? Do you have a, the right size pixels, which could be, you know, the holes in your net for the kind of fish you're trying to catch? And you could also think about it as, you know, the, whether your vessel is seaworthy, like your mount, because mm -hmm. that really is the most important part in the system. And then when you bring your catch home, you're not going to serve it raw. You have to cook it. And um, the skills of a chef, I think, are totally different from the skills of a fisherman. So image processing um, requires, I think, as much dedication as image acquisition. And um, there are several steps. And I think it takes time and a lot of effort to do both. Um, and the second analogy I'd use is to music. I think that both astronomy and music have a lot in common. One, is, one of the things they have in common is that they both involve a lot of joy, and, uh, and I think that they're, to me, every image has an emotive, emotive component to it. And I think if you had, you, know, you could have the grandest, finest piano in the world, but if you only play it with one hand, you're only going to get a melody out of it. And, if you, and over time, and with practice, if you play it with both hands, I think we can add harmony and really bring our instruments to life. And I, I think that the, the effort is, is worth it. So, thanks. Thank you, thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Joe Silverman to talk to you about paying attention to detail. Uh, I first uh, got into astronomy in, in 97, and uh, 1997, and I uh, went to Stellafane. 
And I learned a lot there. Uh, going around, uh, looking at all the scopes, and at night, having an opportunity to look through everybody's scope and asking them questions. And I particularly liked the views through this obsession 15 inch obsession of Dobsonian. It was, the views were crisp, the contrast was good, and I had looked through larger obsessions. I looked through larger scopes, I looked through all kinds of scopes, and I liked this one. And I, not really knowing much about uh, astronomy, uh, said to him, you know, uh, you really lucked out with your mirror. You got a spectacular mirror. I really enjoy the views through your scope. And uh, he uh, sort of told me, it's, it's not my scope, because those 18-inch obsessions or the star masters or the other scopes there, they also have excellent mirrors and all that. The difference is I paid attention to detail. When I uh, got my scope, uh, I learned how to collimate it. I practiced in my backyard on stars and collimated my scope, uh, would collimate it and then take it out of collimation and collimate it again until I really felt comfortable and that my collimation was dead on. And, 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 and so my scope is perfectly collimated. And, and then he mentioned that when I go out observing, I get there an hour early and I use a fan and I make sure my scope is cooled down. Because when they designed all these scopes and did a tolerance analysis, what they did is they assumed that the scope was perfectly collimated and that it is perfectly cooled down. So if you don't do that to your scope, what you are not doing is you are not uh, using the scope to its potential. And uh, so, and then he also mentioned uh, keeping your night vision. Uh, he mentioned uh, uh, that uh, too many people uh, uh, have objects, you know, they use instrumentation that's too bright. And uh, he went into the fact that you have uh, uh, rods and cones in your eyes when you observe under low light conditions. It's the cones that work. But uh, they have uh, intensifiers, uh, rhodopsin. And what happens is rhodopsin decomposes in a bright light and recomposes in low light conditions. And if you uh, adjust the, your vision and night adapt your, uh, your eyesight, you could gain two uh, uh, mags of, uh, you could see things two mags deeper than if uh, you, uh, you're, you've been looking at a bright light. And he sort of mentioned you could test it. Uh, once your eye is uh, dark adapted, then go and look at that instrumentation for uh, two minutes, and then go uh, pick an area in Pegasus, count the stars, before and after, and you will see a difference. Because uh, although the rods are insensitive to uh, red light, it still causes decay of rhodopsin to take place, but at uh, a much lower level. But if it's a uh, bright light, it will decay uh, the rhodopsin, which uh, makes your rods more sensitive uh, a lot quicker. So the idea here is you get this great scope, and, and then what happens is you don't have your night vision, your scope may not be properly collimated, and it may not be cooled down. And, and that will make sure that you're not using the scope to its potential. Uh, okay. Joe, I think you need to hold the mic to keep okay. making that noise. Uh, and, and now, uh, the first uh, slide, please. What I put down here, he also mentioned that this has a compounding effect. So, like when it comes to collimation, 
you know, assuming you do it poorly, there's a 10% error. You do it but pretty good, it's 95 or you do it perfectly. Now, I just made up these figures, but you can see how if you sort of lose 5% on collimation, 5% on cool down, 5% on uh, eye adapted, uh, your eye not being uh, adapted to the darkness, and, and then there's comfort and uh, cleaning your optics, how these compound and uh, degrade the image. And, and so it's not that if you mess up any one of these individually, it doesn't have as big an effect, but it's a compounding effect. And, uh, and so that was the point he made, and that's why the views through his scope were better than the others. Uh, next slide, please. Now, a lot of times you could uh, just figure things out yourself. Uh, you don't need to know much about optics to see if your scope is properly collimated or not. If the concentric circles aren't centered properly, your scope isn't properly collimated. So it's very easy for you to just put it in and out of focus and find out if your scope is collimated or not. If your optics are pinched, well then this image appears. Uh, I just put that down because I had bought an 8 inch daub that had pinched optics. If your, uh, screen, if your uh, scope hasn't cooled down, well a hot air rises and when you put it in and out of focus, you would see something like that. Here is the scene conditions. You have your concentric circle and, and then there's a lot of movement in between. But this could also be a result of a boundary layer in front of your scope, a thermal boundary layer in front of your scope, and I'll be going into detail about that. Uh, next slide, and pass over to the next one. Because uh, Now, cooling down your scope is uh, quite simple. All you need to do is put a fan in the back of it. And uh, what I found the best is to buy a big fan and to minimize on vibration, and to minimize on uh, the amount of power you draw is for the fan to move slowly. And so this uh, fan draws 0.13 amps. Some of the smaller ones that move, uh, that move a lot quicker, spin a lot quicker, use 0.25 amps. And uh, then I put a shock cord on it, and uh, and I and uh, to sort of create this baffle, I bought a, a do at the dollar store a ring binder and used one side of it and just velcroed it and screwed it to the uh, the baffle. Now what I found this did is that it uh, cut the cool down time in half. So this is a one inch mirror on this eight inch scope. Dob, it took uh, about 25 minutes to be cooled down. Next slide, please. Now, this is what happens when your mirror is uh, warm. It warms the air in front of it, and then hot air rises, and it goes like uh, along the scope. Now, if you have a fan blowing on the back, it starts to cool down this mirror here, and it gets rid of the uh, the warm air on the top. But it doesn't get rid of the thermal boundary air layer. Now this thermal boundary layer is less dense than the air around it. So there's really a refractive index differential. So when the light goes in, it bends. When the light gets reflected back, it bends and it will degrade the performance of your whole optical system. Because what this becomes is a weak lens right in front of your mirror. Now there are many ways of getting rid of it. Uh, sometimes you just cool down the mirror here. If you cool down the mirror here, it will take a while longer. You can turn it the other way and then draw air back into the mirror to hit the mirror and then this could break up this thermal boundary layer. 
the problem is uh, I haven't read too much on how strong that uh, fan has to be, whether you may add some vibration, uh, and, and so I just don't do it that way. I just uh, have the air blowing against the back of the mirror. Some people with large scopes put fans here because if the mirror is thick, it's going to take a long time for it to cool down, and this breaks up the boundary layer. But a, a lot of times, I think dogs could perform a lot better if they were properly cooled down. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Oh, okay, uh, before I do this, I'll go back two slides. Uh, another slide? Okay, here. Now, this is uh, a dog I have, an Antares 8-inch uh, dog. Now, when I bought this dog, I made some changes to it. Uh, one of the changes I did, I, I, I put flocking paper on it. And that flocking paper, you can see it's an extreme case here, but it, uh, I took a flash photo of it. And you can see how uh, the flocking paper really uh, stops the reflection compared to the paint that was used. So I think it pays to spend about 10 bucks on flocking paper and put it opposite your focuser. Another thing that happened is that when I got this uh, daub, uh, there are two posts, mirror posts, that here, I only had one here, because they had put it in uh, the wrong way, and I brought this mirror here, and this, uh, can I have the light on more, uh, uh, a bit brighter? The, uh, the main, because <laughs> uh, this, uh, I, I, like when I got this dog, it was like this on the scope. Not only that, okay, I don't even need. Uh, Turn it over, so it doesn't pull up. Okay, well. It's got more light on it. Uh, now, another thing is, it was pinched. This, these were on it so hard that it smudged the scope. And uh, there's, it smudged on all three sides. And, and so they took a, a mirror that is one-sixth wave, and then they put it on this, and they uh, pinched the mirror. So like the scope. Uh, this dog I bought second hand for 300 bucks. It was supposed to come with a one-sixth wave uh, mirror. I think the mirror is one-sixth wave. And then they take a mirror, <coughs> put it in, and they pinch it. And then they put it in so that there's one, uh, all the weight rests on one post instead of two. There's a 50-50 chance they would get it right because there's six screws and it's uh, three posts. So there was a 50% right they'd get it here, here, but it got put on, in my case, this way. Uh, now, the idea here is the mirror should be free floating so I can move it. And when you are looking at the horizon, the two posts are here and all the weight rests on these two posts. Then as you move it towards the zenith, it's like this, and all the weight rests on three tabs at the base. So what this mirror cell has to do, it has to move from the horizon to the zenith without moving, and without pinching the scope, and this mirror cell does that because I uh, collimated it with a Barlow laser. I kept it at the horizon, and then I moved it up to the zenith, and it stayed rock solid. So here's a pretty good uh, mirror on an excellent mirror cell. But when they put it together, they pinched it, and they uh, put it on one post. And, uh, and so they didn't pay attention uh, to detail.
And, and so if you get a scope like this and you just make a few changes to it, you could turn one of these scopes into uh, a very good scope. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, now here is uh, looking at the different optical elements, the primary mirror, primary cell uh, quality, cool down, eyepiece quality, optical anti-reflection. So I basically discussed this without doing the eyepiece. And then there are other things to discuss. Secondary mirror quality, which is important. Uh, the secondary mirror size and the focuser and distance of uh, distance of the focal plane uh, with the draw with the uh, with the focuser. I was going to leave this because uh, I feel I only have about 10 minutes, so this will take me about another 10-12 minutes. Should I do it or wait? No, for you next? should not. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> next yeah. next class okay. or next uh, meeting, and so uh, that's that will be it. Okay, thank you. So Bob. I'll. I'll do those other slides later. Okay. Good job. Thanks, Greg. Good job. Okay. Is this too loud? No, it's okay. Okay, uh, just before the break here, uh, Chuck O'Dale is going to come up and say a few words. Okay, um, a few orbits of the sun ago, I had the honor of being your president, and now time flies. I'm at the end of being your past president. Uh, this is going to be my last uh, duty as your past president, which is part of the nominating committee. And um, our, our idea is to have a, a strong council, and we do now. And uh, some of us are moving on, as, as I said, time flies. And fortunately, uh, we have a full slate uh, for the next uh, council. Uh, put it up, please. There we go. So, uh, so far, uh, nominations. Uh, Al Scott is going uh, as for president. Gary Boyle for vice president. Chris, uh, uh, with a sore elbow, uh, will remain our secretary. Hans, uh, our treasurer and councillors, uh, Eve, uh, Carmen, and Stephen. Uh, the meeting chair, Bill, thank you very much for carrying on. We really appreciate this. Uh, I know what... <coughs> yes, yes. I've been there, done that. I know what you're going through and uh, f fully appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and again, uh, national reps. Um, uh, Rob has uh, been taking the, uh, the full brunt of this because Every time there's been a national meeting, I've either been uh, up in Algonquin Park looking at a crater, hey Eric, <laughs> or uh, working on a contract. So, uh, but I'm trying to get there, and of course, as pr past president, I'm uh, at the end of my leash uh, coming this December. So, uh, next slide. Uh, that's the nominations. Uh, anybody that wishes uh, uh, to be submitted, uh, these are the rules. Uh, must be members in good standing. Uh, nomination may be submitted by any, for any position. Must be supported by two members and sent to the secretary, Chris Terran, by 8 p.m. on November 28, 2010. So that's the rules. Uh, that's all I want to say about this. Uh, and again, we have a very strong council, and it looks like we're going to have another one as well. And I want to uh, finish uh, at the last council meeting. Um, as we say, time flies, technology increases. We're thinking, or we'd want to, set up a uh, Facebook uh, page for the uh, Ottawa Centre. And I volunteered for it, and then it was suggested, well, somebody maybe a little bit less age-challenged than I am should take it over. <laughs> um, because there's something about bird calls we have to know as well, uh, tweets and stuff like that. <laughs> anyway. Um, We'd like to go ahead with it. If anybody would like to take this on or assist me or uh, uh, a bunch, uh, please come forward and let me know or Chris and we can discuss it. Uh, this is an ongoing project. Uh, we have a very strong website and I think a Facebook and a tweet uh, would uh, really help. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, time for the break. Uh, We've got a few quick notices just to remind you of. First of all, uh, next, uh, uh, what is it, next weekend, is it, Attila? Yeah. <coughs> next Friday. 
is uh, the annual dinner meeting. Uh, there are still tickets available. Uh, if you're interested in coming, looks like we've got a great speaker this time around. Should be a very interesting and rewarding evening. Uh, you can see, are you taking care of it, Mike? Or, no. oh, Al is. Al is taking care of it uh, this evening. So see Al. Uh, for those of you who didn't see him wave there, uh, wave again, please, Al. Right there, catch up with them and uh, pick up tickets. Next, please, Attila. Uh, the calendars are available. Uh, Mike has got them out in the lobby. Uh, same price, lovely calendar, uh, great uh, gifts. Do help yourself to them. As well, we've got one in the door prizes tonight. Okay, next up, our 10-minute uh, astronomy news with Al Scott. Hey. <clears throat> so I've got some uh, interesting news for you this evening. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. I'm also suffering from the same thing that uh, some of our earlier speakers have been having troubles with. Uh, so we'll go to the first slide. I've got a, a movie sequence on uh, Omega Centauri. Uh, Omega Centauri is a, a giant globular star cluster and Hubble Space Telescope has taken some high resolution images of it in 2002 and 2006. And what uh, they've done is they've actually been able to plot the uh, location of the, of the stars between the two images, uh, compare them, and then uh, actually predict where they're going to be in 10,000 years based on their, their measured proper motions. So can you run the image? So we're going to zoom in here to Hubble Space Telescope resolution. And then it's going to play a movie of uh, the next 10,000 years in the center of Omega Centauri. So there it is. That's uh, based on a four-year baseline. And they're able to predict uh, 10,000 years of, of proper motion. And they're just kind of all going in different directions like you'd expect in a big globular uh, cluster with no actual apparent plane of motion. But it's interesting in terms of the science because then they can, this work can yield insights into how stellar groupings formed in the early universe, whether there's a black hole in the center of the, uh, or an intermediate mass black hole potentially in the center of the, of the, of the cluster. So we'll go to the next one. Now onto something a little more esoteric. <coughs> and uh, th this is a, a little bit of personal interest to myself. Um, anybody know what Buckminster Fullerene is? Put up your hand. OK, that's good. That's good. The, these, uh, these pictures here are schematics of, of Buckminster Fullerene. Is this a, a laser here? Yes. So the, these are uh, one of the um, uh, crystalline forms of carbon, actually, which was recently discovered in uh, 1985 by Croto and Smalley, resulting in a Nobel Prize. There's, there's graphite, there's diamond, and there's, there's fullerene. This is a, a C60 molecule, so 60 carbon atoms. Um, uh, it's a huge molecule. It's actually a soccer ball structure, hexagonal. You have hexagonal patterns and, and pentagonal patterns. It's, it's a, just like a the same sort of patterns you'd see in a soccer ball if, with, with carbon at the corners. And there's a lot of scientific interest in this molecule. It's very robust. It can form, they can actually form in, in different numbers of, molecule, of, of carbon. You can have C70, which is also stable. You can have uh, cylinders of carbon in this form. It's kind of like a graf graphite sheets that roll up and, and, and seal off into these, these crystalline forms. And there's a lot of interesting research that's been going on in the, in the past uh, 25 years or 30, 30 years or so looking at the applications for these things, because they're conductive. Uh, they're, they've been looking at in microelectronics. Uh, maybe they'd be useful in adhesive or in uh, lubricants, in uh, electron emitters, displays, that sort of thing. Uh, but just recently, they've been discovered in space uh, through their infrared spectral signature. And here are two spectra of uh, planetary nebula. And the red lines denote the predicted positions of Buckminster Fullerene uh, signals. And you can see that there are 
little peaks at these positions. Uh, so this is a very recent discovery. Many people didn't think that large molecules could exist in the in the harsh uh, regions of outer space. They've, they've been detected now not only in planetary nebulas but also in the diffuse interstellar medium where the, a lot of harsh ultraviolet rays would tend to break up most molecules into ions and shred them. Uh, in fact, when I started my grad work, people didn't think there were large molecules out there. There was a few, you know, maybe they had just discovered six atom chains in space using radio telescopes and then, you know, they were building up maybe seven or ten atom chains. So people thought these things formed in, in stellar outflows uh, where gas phase atoms came together and made these, these, these molecules. But they're very interesting uh, because people posit now that, that these large complex aromatic carbons that are formed in space actually might have been the building blocks for life on Earth. Uh, in fact, now Buckminster Fullerene is difficult to say. People call them buckyballs now because uh, it's neater. Uh, buckyballs have been found around aging stars. Uh, they've actually been found in meteorites. Uh, and by looking at them, they, they actually, when they form, they can trap gas molecules inside of them. And you can have some, in, some idea of the gases that were around when they formed. Uh, and, and so extraterrestrial gases have been measured in these meteorites trapped within fullerenes. Um, but the interesting thing about this is nobody has a really good idea of how these things form. Um, in the lab, people form these things uh, using graphite electrodes and making a spark in a vacuum. And then you have this carbon soot that forms, and a small fraction of the soot forms in these perfect uh, crystalline spheres. In space, though, uh, the concentration of hydrogen is, was thought to be too high for these things to form. Because hydrogen, when you have it next to carbon, it makes it into methane and, and gases. It doesn't form pure crystalline structures. Uh, so over the, over the past uh, 20 or so years, most researchers have thought that these things could only form in carbon-rich environments where there's very little hydrogen available. And there's not many places in the interstellar medium that hydrogen doesn't dominate. So they were thought to be around, and people hadn't discovered them until large space telescopes like Spitzer came along in the last year or so and these publications have started to come out. So my interest in this is I, I was actually working in the lab in my PhD uh, playing with uh, amorphous carbon dust, uh, building it in the lab with hydrogen and shooting it with lasers and seeing what came off. And I published a paper back in 1997 that predicted that buckyballs would be formed when carbon dust actually collided in shocks around stars. And so this is actually really kind of interesting for me because this is the first actual reference to my, my work in 20 years. So. <laughs> Thank you. So now I'm going to quit and become a professor. <laughs> no. All right. So, uh, and then on to another uh, personal interest one here. Uh, the diffuse aurora... Uh, now there's a soundtrack that plays on this. Is it actually playing or is it, do we have to click it to start it? I don't know if you can hear it. Uh, the diffuse aurora is not the bright court curtains that you typically see with the northern lights. It's a dim, hard to see background glow. And scientists think that this is caused by electrons that are trapped in the Earth's magnetic fields that somehow get down and hit the atmosphere. Until recently, scientists didn't know how the trapped electrons that are high up in the field got down to the atmosphere. New research suggests that uh, very long frequency waves uh, that are actually called chorus are responsible for scattering the electrons from these high uh, altitudes spiraling uh, around the magnetic field down into the Earth's atmosphere. And I was, there's actually a soundtrack you can hear. It's not working? Okay. But if, if, you were, if you were to hear the, the soundtrack, it sounds just like uh, birds. Uh, you would hear the dawn chorus of birds in the morning. Well, interestingly, this, this is actually uh, EM fields. And if you, you can build a, a transducer that picks up EM fields and trans, transfers them into uh, sound, it sounds just like birds chirping in the morning. And there was a talk uh, by John Thompson here uh, several years ago that first brought this to my attention. Uh, there's a guy named uh, McGreevy. You can go and search his website who has specs on the internet. You can actually build a detector. Uh, and I've actually built one after John Thompson's talk. And this is it. 
It's basically got a uh, just a little uh, amplified speaker and then a detector with a with a one meter whip antenna. And I don't know if it's actually working, but you can pick up uh, lightning. Mostly, you pick up 60 hertz hum. There's not much to hear, but you can bring it next to the light. It's really useful if you want to, if you have that buried dog wire and it, uh, it actually gets broken, you can actually find the break. <laughs> but it's really neat. If you take it out away from buildings and power lines uh, in the morning, you hear the hum. Uh, it's like chirping. And it's that chirping, the, those waves, which are caused when the magnetic field of the Earth uh, rotates from the, the long tail into the bow shock region where the solar wind is hitting it. And what's happening is the solar wind is screaming through space and it's pricking the, the magnetic field lines like a harp and causing them to ro oscillate at, at these frequencies that you can actually hear, at, at frequencies that you would, you would hear if your ears could pick up EM waves. So this is basically allows you to hear it. And these are the things that are scattering electrons and causing this diffuse aurora. So it's just kind of a neat uh, all-around story. Uh, so you have to go to the website to actually listen to the Dawn course or build your own and, and listen to it yourself. So thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. I'll have to get the plan for that from you. <laughs> Looks like fun. Uh, next up, uh, Richard Alexandrovich to talk to us about searching for another Earth. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Twenty years ago, if um, someone would have um, brought up the notion of looking for um, planets around other stars uh, other than our sun, um, the, re the return answer would have been one of disbelief, if you would have mentioned something to that effect. Um, impossible, can do it, um, a science relegated for our descendants of the future. In fact, uh, these ideas were conceived uh, since antiquity when um, humans have contemplated whether the, uh, there are other worlds orbiting those distant stars. In, 20 thing, in 2010, rather, things have changed uh, quite a lot. We know that uh, solar system architecture is not confined uh, strictly to our stellar neighborhood. We know there is a rich diversity and morphology of stellar systems that are waiting to be explored out there. And up until now, ground-based scopes have been doing the lion's share of the planet hunting. By discovering literally hundreds of planets uh, beyond our solar system, the public's interest has been now rejuvenated once again. The science is now at the forefront of astronomy. According to the last census, about 450 planets have been added to the list, and of course the list keeps on growing. There has been clear evidence for substantial numbers of the three main categories of uh, extrasolar planets, or if you want to call exoplanets. Uh, next, please. There's the, the gas giants, uh, the ones that they were starting to find out at, at the beginning of the, um, of the uh, campaign, starting in 95. These are hot Jupiter-like uh, uh, exoplanets that orbit very close to their scars. That's why they're called hot Jupiters, because uh, their atmospheres are extremely, uh, extremely warm, up to about uh, two, 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And next came the ice giants. They are similar in composition to Uranus and Neptune. Uh, the super-Earths, which have been the latest uh, discoveries, they're hot and rocky, with masses several times larger than the Earth, and of course, because they're hot, they are close also to their parent stars. That ultimately, uh, ultimately brings us to the next chapter in exoplanet research, and the, the most interesting, I think. That is finding an Earth analog, or jumping even a step closer, an exact Earth twin. It would be an astronomical revelation, not only to the scientific community, but to the public at large as well. Uh, finding another world similar to ours would have enormous implications upon our society. Um, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the group in Geneva University in Switzerland, led by uh, Michael Mayer, had discovered the closest Earth-like analog around a red dwarf that's only about 20 light years away in the constellation Libra. Although follow-up observations are needed, as with any new finding, the planet is suspected of, of having a liquid ocean and some type of an atmosphere. But again, that's still uh, hypothesis at this point. 
Um, the orbit is 68, 66.8 days, which just puts it inside the habitable zone. Don't forget, when it's a small red dwarf, the habitable zone shrinks, so you can place the planet closer in order to be um, uh, conducive for life. Um, the, uh, the planet was detected with the radial velocity method, which uses uh, tiny motions in the star as a mass or planet tugs on it to and fro with the uh, European Space Observatory uh, Telescope in uh, Chile. Uh, next, please. In 1984, Bill Baruki of NASA, uh, the lead scientist, and A.L. Summers proposed the notion of looking for planets around other stars using the transit photometry method, and it's all about light in this case. It was far-fetched at that time. The transit technique would record tiny dips in starlight as a suspected planet would cross or transit its host star. Coming to fruition during the 1990s, the world was ready to apply this strategy in space-based telescopes. Next, please. That is why NASA has conceived Discovery Mission Number 10, uh, part of the Origins program called the Kepler Mission, named after 16th century mathematician and astrophysicist Johannes Kepler. Costing just under $600 million, the endeavor will explore the structure and diversity of planetary systems beyond our own. To do this, Kepler will need to stare at a large inventory of stars. Next, please. Anywhere from about 100,000 to as many as 170,000. Kepler will be the first in line, along with other missions, to, to answer the space old, uh, the age old question is, are there other Earths out there? And eventually, if there's some type of biology as well. In fact, back in 90, 1996 and 98, an original mission dubbed Frequency of Earth Sized Inner Planets, or FRECEP, was ultimately turned down. So that didn't really get off the ground. The stars Kepler will be looking at will be similar in size, mass, temperature, and composition of the sun. In other words, those stars that are hydrogen burning main sequence types that have been selected while variables will be crossed off the list for obvious reasons, as you will see. The target stars will be sun-like because their overall luminosity varies less than the change in brightness caused by the passage of an Earth-sized planetary transit. Next, please. Just to give you an example, the uh, solar, of, uh, the, the sun rather, has a um, uh, variability of one part in 100,000. The, the star, our sun, is variable, but not as much as some other stars. It does increase in luminosity and then it diminishes. An Earth-sized transit is about one in 10,000. So you can see that if something of that, that size with that amount of light block will, act, uh, will actually show up as a, a robust uh, uh, signal. Now, most of the uh, variability will be in the ultraviolet, and the Kepler Space uh, Telescope will be looking at optical lights, so we could knock that out. They won't be doing any, any science in the ultraviolet light. Photometry with these pinpoint light sources will still be um, a daunting task, despite the cutting-edge technology, regardless how advanced the science packages on Kepler will be. It has taken eight institutional partners, 30 scientists, and many software designers to carry on this mission, including about one million man hours of labor. Next, please. Kepler will also determine the percent, uh, percentage of terrestrial and larger planets that are located in or near the habitable zone, or HZ. The habitable zone is really where a planet, um, where, um, uh, liquid, where water can exist as in its um, liquid state, and of course, water is the main component uh, uh, to life, and if you have water, then probably, as logic goes, um, there will be uh, some type of biology lurking in there. And as you can see, the... Um, is this, where is the laser pointer? Is it somewhere here? There it is. The, um, the, um, our habitable zone here, it's, it's the green one where Earth is, which is one astronomical unit. And around 40 Eridani, there's, an, uh, there's actually a planet called Vulcan, which is around this star here. As you can see, the habitable zone shrinks as the star gets smaller and um, there is less of a, a temperature difference, like the temperature is cooler. But in a large star, such as a, a massive, uh, let's say, a, a large uh, yellow giant or a massive uh, luminous blue variable, the habitable zone will extend further out. So you can see this is our star, a small 
or red dwarf, and a large uh, star with a mass much bigger than, than our sun. So the habitable zone uh, increases and stars, uh, for, in order for life to exist, will have to exist further away from that particular star. Now, um, the sizes and shapes of planetary, uh, planetary orbits will also be plotted as well. Whether they form an eccentric ellipse, whether they are circular or a shade of gray somewhere in between. Astronomers will also find out if multiple star systems are capable of harboring those planets. Will their orbits remain stable over uh, many years? Uh, will, um, will the planets be slingshot away into the void or will the planets actually be sucked into uh, our star? Finally, Kepler will unravel the uh, secrets of the stars themselves, the properties within, such as internal dynamics that generate a star's magnetic field. Space probes like Canada's MOST and the European Space Agency's CORAT are others that work on a, t on a topic or a field called helioseismology, or if you want to relate it to the stars, it's asteroseismology uh, relating to those uh, pinpoints of light. All this data that will be collected by Kepler will be used to support future space missions, such as the Space Interferometry Mission, or SIM, S-I-M, and the Terrestrial Planet Finder, or a, a TPF. There's also the Planet Imager, but that's quite well off into the future. Method used to locate other planets will be, of course, as I said earlier, the transit method. Next, please. Many of the planets found have been confirmed with the radial velocity technique, uh, which uh, means that uh, when a planet is pulling upon its host star, it it induces a slight wobble in the star. It moves it back and forth. So the bigger the planet is, uh, the more detectable um, it will be. It'll be easier to detect because that mass is pulling more on the star itself. The uh, approach works well with close-in hot Jupiters, such as uh, large objects uh, tug more upon their star. But as planets become smaller, and further away from the star, it is even harder to detect them and a little more challenging. And uh, next, please. So we enter the photometric transit method, which is being used by, um, by Kepler and, of course, uh, most, I believe, as well. The typical duration of a transit lasts anywhere between 2 and 16 hours of a planet going across the disk of a star. The change in brightness of a star is typically 1 in 10,000 or 100 parts per million. As a matter of fact, uh, Kepler was tested earlier about um, whether this would work because uh, this was with a large star that was going around um, the back toward the planet. As a close hot Jupiter goes in around the back, um, it heats up a lot in the infrared and optical. And of course, uh, the light was, was greater as it was visible with the scope along with the star. But as it went uh, behind the star, um, I'll use as the planet, like I'm using this as an example, as it went behind the star, the light diminished. And that amount was equal to one in 10,000. So scientists called it a eureka moment. They figured, yes, Kepler can find uh, shifts in light as much as one in 10,000. Now, Kepler will be doing the science for at least three and a half years, and most likely extending it to six years, uh, as I would probably think so. So the question is why? Astronomers need at least three transits of an Earth-like planet in an orbit similar to ours. In other words, it takes time and patience. Three would be the minimum, perhaps four transits would be even better to yield a robust detection. The candidate planet would alter starlight in a regular or periodic fashion. It has to be regular or periodic because something else, if it isn't, then it's considered maybe it's a, a transitory object, a strange anomaly. Transits should have the same change in brightness and cover the same amount of time. These are the main factors. So planet hunters will be looking for these traits. Next, please. The depth, the dip in the starlight, how much the uh, starlight dips as a planet goes across its face. The time, the duration, how long it'll take, and the period, which is the time between the transits. So all these have to be constant, and all these have to take place in about three, three and a half years if they are looking for an Earth-like planet at roughly the same distance as we are from the sun. 
for a transit to occur, there's also a lot of tricks to this here, a lot of things to, to weed out as well. Planet planetary systems must be nearly perfectly aligned with our line of sight. Next, please. So in other words, the planet has to go right across the star, its parent star, but a grazing transit is not good enough for a good signal. It has to be right in front. Uh, these systems are not preferentially aligned because the planet could, could go across like this, like this, and sometimes if it's face on, well, of course, that doesn't do anything because we will never see the transit. It's ori oriented in that particular direction. So we don't have any preference for geometry here. Um, as I said, nature did not provide us with a preferred geometry to study the pattern of these planets. As far as probability for an Earth-like planet in an orbit similar to ours, well, it's only about 0.5%. And that is why Kepler needs to look at all these stars. This will be a daunting task. And a good popular analogy, of course, uh, probably some of you have heard, it's like having a flea cross the headlights of a car that is parked three miles away trying to detect that flea, uh, diminishing that amount of light. So why do the science in space? Well, uh, some cases it's a no-brainer here. Next, please. Motions, atmospheric turbulence. The motions in our atmosphere are constantly bending light rays from the stars in many different directions, uh, causing them to twinkle. It's, a, it's an effect that you see from day-to-day uh, from -day life. Um, as an example, when looking at a star, a change by at least 50% or one stellar magnitude can happen just looking through the stars uh, in, through our atmosphere. From ground-based telescopes, gas giants should pose no problem because they are much larger and, as I said, easier to detect. But for small terrestrial worlds, space is really the place to go. And finally, continuous observation. Brightnesses of stars need to be monitored on a continuous basis, such as a two-hour transit over the period of an entire year. Scopes would need to be online in many locations around the globe, and you'll need at least one on the night side of our planet. Also, as we orbit the sun, the available night sky keeps changing, and there will be no one portion of the sky on constant vigil all year round. And last but not least, the bad weather and McCulloch's moon. So there we go. The pros for space-based science. Next, please. Basically, no day-night cycle interruptions, no seasonal cycles, and no atmospheric conditions. Up there in space, there's none of that interference uh, to, ha uh, to place havoc with the observations. Now, what part of our galaxy will the observatory do the work? Next, please. A very familiar region near the Summer Triangle. Um, you've probably seen a lot of this picture many times before. The uh, field of view is right here, and that's the Milky Way here. You've got uh, the um, Cygnus, and you've got Lyra and Aquila here just over to the right. Oh, sorry, right here at the bottom. And um, the space probe will be aimed at a rich star field in the Cygnus Lyra region, except what they call during K-band downlink, which would be only once a month. The area contains hundreds of solar-like stars, a better possibility to find one, just like the sun, hopefully, and with an or, uh, Earth-like planet orbiting around it. Stars that were previously inventoried by ground-based telescopes. In other words, um, scientists did their uh, were homework earlier to uh, find out which area of the um, galaxy has these stars, and um, then they said, okay, this is gonna be the field, this is where we have a good chance uh, of increasing our odds. The distances to the stars will be at least 600 light years and as far away as 3,000 light years. That's about 100 parsecs, where one kiloparsec, uh, sorry, where one parsec is equal to 3.1 light years. So it's between 100 parsecs and one kiloparsec. Kepler's scope will consist of a single-purpose Schmidt design. Uh, next, please. There is the mirror. A more efficient, a more appropriate word would be a photometer, which is almost one meter wide, 0.95 of a meter wide. Starlight will enter the scope, reflecting from this primary mirror, which has been, as you can see, highly polished. Light rays will travel to a focal plane, a ray consisting of 42 CCDs. Next, please. And the CCDs are all over here, the 42, each, the, each one here, is like half a square, is considered one CCD. Um, 
Now, one CCD will be approximately 50 by 25 millimeters. Each CCD is going to have 2,200 by 1,024 pixels. I wish there was a camera like that on the market that I can buy, but it's probably extremely expensive. This high resolution will be crucial in detecting the tiny dips in starlight as a planet goes right by the uh, parent star. While many scopes have a field of view of one square degree, Kepler will boast a very large 105 square degrees, an area similar to your hand held out at arm's length if you put that hand right, right in front of the constellation there. It'll give you an idea of how much space that Kepler will be looking at. Getting back to the uh, photometric process, the data or the photon counts will be collected by an onboard computer, of course. Once monthly, this info will be transmitted or downlinked to the Deep Space Network, or DSN. Next, please. The Deep Space Network has uh, facilities in um, Australia, I believe, um, Spain, and the um, Rockies in the, in the US. It deals mostly with the satellites collecting information, the satellites that deal with stuff from deep space. Anything that comes from beyond our solar system is relayed down to the DISH network. From there, the um, raw data will travel to the Missions Operations Center in Boulder, Colorado, right here. It's a rather complicated process. Then the material will be archived at the Data Management Center at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. Here, the third step. And finally, the data is sent to the Kepler Science Operations Center in California. And here it will be processed, analyzed, to create calibrated light curves that would then reveal a planet. And of course, then it would be disseminated in the news, the papers, magazines, and the general public at large will know about what Kepler is doing. Now, the, um, some people are, have, um, have uh, asked me how, when will be the first um, time or when will we start getting um, you know, some information regarding about the first transit of an Earth-like planet. It should be late in 2012 or more likely 2013, so it's not too far away. Even if there was a null result, they will have some significance or some scientific value uh, to the world. In that case, if that would be the case, then we would know that er the Earth-like worlds are extremely rare, at least in this part of the galaxy or in this part of our neighborhood. Or maybe we're just looking in the wrong place. But there is some promising news in the forecast. There was an updated June report that tells us that Kepler, uh, from June, has identified over 700 extrasolar planet candidates. And as I said, the list keeps on growing. Of course, they have to be sifted out. Canada is the key word because um, it could be something else. It could be a star spot. It could be um, maybe, um, I don't know if the Kepler could see an asteroid, but something else that could be transiting the sun as well, or it could be the variability of that particular star. So um, these signals, sorry. Okay, these signals can also represent uh, like I said, spar star sparts or even a, a binary companion. So what's after Kepler? Well, obviously, with current technology, it will be impossible to send humans to the stars. It'll take us about 60,000 years with current day technology to go to Alpha Centauri, only 4.2 light years away. Costs would be enormous. So astronomers will try to get a direct light detection of the planet in question to gather a good spectrum. A good spectrum would reveal a planet's atmosphere, and therefore, if the planet's atmosphere is conducive to life, then further uh, tests will be done on that particular planet. As a matter of fact, the northern hemisphere was chosen because there are more uh, sun-like stars in, um, in, in the northern hemisphere compared to the southern hemisphere, and there are more ground-based telescopes uh, up here in the northern half. So perhaps in the not so distant future, when we go gaze up at the summer sky with our children or even grandchildren, we can tell them that somewhere out there in Cygnus is another world just like ours. That's it. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, next up, to say a few words to you about uh, what's going on at the national level, uh, Rob Dick. Um, <clears throat> administration. Nobody likes administration. However, there is some fun administration next week. 
annual dinner, get your ticket. By the way, if you're going to be uh, interested, if you're interested, some of us are going to wear tuxedos just for fun. So if you want to join us, that'd be great so you don't look out of place so much. <laughs> Talking about looking out of place. <clears throat> the RDSC has been around for over 100 years and uh, it's been mulling along quite well. But every 10 years or so, we think about what should we be doing uh, with limited resources. And once again, we're looking at this again, and we now have another employee to uh, look with us. So we have a new executive director, and she's put together uh, a number of items that, we're, that are under review. And what I'd like to do is quickly run through some of these. And since we don't have too much time, if you could talk to me later or maybe send me an email, get my email out front, and uh, give me your ideas on this so we can funnel them back to the national office. So I'm just going to walk out here so that I can, uh, I don't think I need the microphone. The first one is the mission space statement. We only got three slides, so it's going to be real quick. I think three anyway. To inspire curiosity in all Canadians about the universe. To share scientific knowledge and to foster co collaboration in astronomical pursuits. Very vague, which is where they probably should be. But when it comes down to starting to spend some of your, uh, your membership money, these statements are going to be used to, to, to separate out the ideas that people propose at council or people that, um, that, that come along or, or challenges we have, they'll help us solve these challenges. So that's a mission statement that's going to be guiding, uh, we think, if it's everybody agrees, we'll be guiding what we do into the future, probably for the next five or ten years. The next slide is a mission statement, somewhat different. And this is something actually we've been doing for a long, long time. The RASC encourage, uh, encourages improved understanding of astronomy through education, outreach, research, publication, partnership, and community. Partnership is something that we used to do a lot in the past, not so much today. Today, observing is more like a loner in the field with a telescope, not like the old days where you gathered around in meteor coffins, don't go in, I won't go into where that name came from, and uh, as a group and observe the sky. So this is what we have hoped to be doing in the future, and this is where we're going to be putting money, and you can see some important ones, education, outreach. And also research is something new, uh, because right now the REC really doesn't do research, however some members do as uh, part of their amateur professional collaboration. Publications, we got the REC journal, and we publish in other places as well. And again, partnership, amateur professional cooperation, and just through a bunch of amateurs getting together. <coughs> and community, where we're trying to get out to the actual public. Again, part of the outreach again. The next slide is the strategic objectives. And this is what's going to really figure out where we're going to put the money here. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think we got these ideas? I mean, come on. <laughs> Center support program. What would you like to the national office? Because you don't know what the heck's going on in national. Well, I guess you do now. But, uh, but <laughs> what should national office do for centers? They got their own idea. Our centers got their its own ideas, and we really have to get together and come up with a rational group of items, practical items that. The things that we need. For example, one, one of the major expenses of, the, of our center is insurance for our outreach programs and our observatory and so on. And wouldn't it be nice if the national office can get together with one big insurance plan that will cover us. So that will actually shave off, gosh, I can't remember now, $8,000 of off your, your membership money, an awful lot of money. I can't remember. I, I was at the council meeting when we discussed this. I just can't remember the number, but there's an awful lot of money. For the center Result itself? of the year? Yes, yeah, center. What was it? 33, 34. 33, 3, $3,400. Okay, that's still a lot. Think about it. What you could do with that kind of money? More beer. More beer. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe upscale beer. Make a wine. <laughs> Volunteer support program. In terms of, there's all, everybody in the REC except for two people are volunteers. How do we support them? What support do they need? If you've got ideas, let us know. We've got a bunch of ideas too, but it doesn't mean that we know what's going on. You people do as well, especially if you do some of these outreach volunteer activities. 
improved response time for customer service. In the old days, it would take probably about a month to get an answer out of national office. Now it happens in a few days. Is that fast enough? Maybe we should automate some of the, the services that the REC provides. And they're trying to get it down to about three to seven days. Increase revenues. Ooh, that's always nice. 30%. I don't know how they're going to do that, but they're going to try. Increase the membership to 5,000 members. We were up over 4,000 members. We slipped back below that. We want to get that back up again. One reason why we're having fewer members is because we tend to lose about 25% every year. People come and go on the order of 25%. Sorry, people leave on the order of 25%. We get most of those 25% back, but why are they actually leaving? If you know why, let us know. Especially if you just quit and you don't want to pay. Sorry? Discover a new comment. That, that's one way to get, get a lot more public interest. I'll get them, but will they keep will we are we able to keep them? It seems like we can't. There's 25% of our membership we don't know how to keep. We'd like to figure that one out. And also one thing that isn't down here that's been in Sky and Telescope as well, and that is I bet there are not too many people here that don't have gray hairs. <laughs> and we'd like to get a few more people that don't have as many gray hairs. Because your gray hair is your cortex growing out, which means you're not as smart. We want some younger people that are smarter than guys like me. <laughs> Develop a market and communication plan. I really don't know what that means. So if you've got an idea, that triggers an idea in your mind as to what we can put in a list, what that means, that would be good because right now it's just gibberish to me. Maybe it's my cortex growing out. I don't know. But if you've got ideas, what sort of if you're good at it in your business, if you're good at marketing, that kind of thing, uh, communications, the best way to communicate, one idea is this, the idea of this uh, Tweety thing that was mentioned earlier, whatever that is. If you understand that, talk, talk to Chuck or myself. Both of us could probably learn and, uh, and we can put some plan together in the center, but we also need to do it nationally. And then also, this is the real problem area that always turns people off is bylaw reform. We've got bylaws that are, they define everything to the T, which means if you want to change anything, it takes about two years because you've got to change the bylaw. We're going to completely revamp the bylaw. And if you know something about bylaws, then maybe we could make use of your talent. You can see the timelines here are typically next year. So that gives us about a year to do all this, which is actually quite reasonable, I think. It can be done. But the thing is what they need are ideas up front. And if you can come up with these ideas, we'll pass them down to get them starting to work on an REC that we all can live with and we'll all be proud to be members of. And I think that's the last slide. Thank you, Rob. Okay, thank you. See you at the dinner. Okay, last up, uh, admittedly we're running a little bit late, but uh, Mike Mogadam uh, is here to talk to you about public outreach and what's been going on. Welcome. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. I know we're running late, so I'll, I'll, I'll go real quick. Uh, quick question before we get started here. Uh, just maybe a raise of hands. Who's here for the first time uh, tonight? Just a few people. Well, welcome. Thanks for coming. I really appreci appreciate that. I understand there's a, a, a couple of school teachers. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the school outreach we do. If you're interested, I'll be around after the break um, at the end of the day here, uh, evening here, and uh, love to talk to you about what we can uh, offer to your school. So let's go on, Attila, please. Okay, a little bit about what's happened and what will happen in, in the outreach program. By far and away, our biggest event of the year is um, Science Fun Fest. It's one of the National Science and Technology Week uh, events. Uh, very much hands-on oriented, very much uh, geared towards uh, developing an interest in science for, for, uh, for, uh, for youth. Um, uh, it was an uh, uh, event that, uh, with lots of exhibits. Uh, it's, it, span, it, mainly, it was in the Booth Street complex area, Booth and, uh, and Carling. Uh, this is the second year that the Ottawa Centre participated, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful event. We, we figured the attendance was up about 20% from last year, so it's a, just a, a monster event for us. Um, like last year, we had an in, uh, indoor and outdoor exhibits. And by the way, I'm told that we're one of the largest uh, ex exhibitors now at, uh, at FunFest. So it's given that FunFest has been going on since the late 80s. Uh, feel pretty happy about that. Next slide. 
Okay, so a couple of photos here. Here is the outdoor crowd. Um, we uh, the, the the solar solar observers there. Um, we uh, you can see just looking at the bottom there. It's Bart Tector. Bart always goes to town. When he uh, when he comes, he'll bring his trailer and, and uh, his, his his seal eleven and. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's quite a setup. The uh, top two there, there are some solar scopes, um, Richard McDonald and, uh, and, and, and Jimmy uh, uh, Book, um, always very popular with the kids. Next slide. Um, just uh, um, beyond uh, Greenland there, having his arm on uh, Gander, I think, is, uh, is Chuck O'Dale. And uh, um, Chuck and Ron T. Martin in the background, they're partly obscured by the balloon there. Um, Chuck has his uh, impact crater display and, and exhibit, and of course, Ronte Martin has his, um, his, um, his moon display. Very popular. They're in a hallway, and it always uh, grabs the attention of the people who walk by. Next slide. Um, Ron is one of the easiest guys to photograph. He's always smiling and always very, always very photogenic here. And you, you can see with his uh, meteorite display. Lev, I saw you earlier. You can see the uh, Abbey meteor on the top right there, the Abbey um, uh, meteorite uh, crater casting. Bloody thing weighs about as much as the meteorite. Um, it, uh, very popular, always uh, catches the uh, attention of uh, people again. Next slide. So, and, and of course, this, these are all there, our indoor exhibit. Now, this is um, something that I really, um, about, I don't know, must be about nine months or a year ago, uh, a fellow named Bob Barkley came by, and he, uh, Bob brought his um, painting to our, uh, one of our monthly meetings, and uh, it's a celebration of Galileo. And it's a very intricate, detailed uh, uh, painting, which, which he, which he uh, made himself. And, and the nice thing about this painting here is there's, there's lots of details, lots of stories in, 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 the, uh, in the painting here. And, and I had asked Bob, I said, you know, Bob, could, would you mind bringing the painting? And, and at the same time, in the corner of my head, I was thinking, well, how do we, uh, how does a paint, how can kids relate to a painting? Uh, so I posed the question back to him, is there anything we can do to make this um, of interest, your painting of interest to, to youth, to the kids? And he said, almost right away, he came back with an email, how about I come up with an I spy um, idea where he says uh, he'll we'll give away you know, those astro cards that we have, um, you know, those, those little astronomy cards that we gave away in IYA. If you can spot all of the ten objects in his I spy list, um, you'll win. You'll win the um, the uh, astro 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 card. Well, there's a testament to um, Bob's idea. It worked. Okay, and I saw many a many a, um, a boy and girl. Uh, you know, just with their heads, uh, nose up real close to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the painting there, looking for objects. So really well done, Bob. The guy's amazing. Very creative fellow. Next slide. Okay, in, in the uh, Kamsa Hall, which is, one of the, which is an, a big auditorium in, in, uh, in um, one of the buildings on, on Boo Street, which is where we had our main uh, auditorium. Now, what was new this year was the um, Star Lab um, Planetarium, which, which is the... Uh, so that big amoeba in the right there, a big brown uh, uh, object. It's actually black, but it might turn out um, brown in the uh, photo here. But um, huge draw, okay? And uh, in fact, we were really were overtaken by the crowds. Okay, so next year we need to plan, I need to plan something different here in terms of, you know, how can we lay this out and so forth. In fact, so overtaken that um, we had to wrap the crowds around the uh, sort of the perimeter of our, our exhibit. That worked well on the one hand because they went and saw all of our exhibit as they were lining up. But on the other hand, it was just overwhelming there. And, and um, somewhere in here is, a, yeah, on the top left, there is a picture of Jeff um, uh, Cohill with uh, his, uh, his uh, refractor. And uh, he really was uh, overtaken by it. So Jeff, uh, well done. It was, a, it was quite, a, uh, quite a storm that came, but a, a nice storm, that's for sure. Um, and you can see our display uh, on the bottom left there. Uh, just a, just a really overwhelming, the, the, the crowds there. And of course, we gave away the uh, Sky News magazines. Next slide. Uh, um, one of the things which really worked out well as well was we actually were fortunate. The, the Fun Fest organizers came to us and said, "Would you be interested in joining us in the purchase of a, um, of a, uh, or contributing towards the purchase of a uh, the grand prize, the Fun Fest grand prize?" And they said, "We're thinking about a telescope," and they said, "Would you be interested in um, um, sponsoring this with us?" So I went to Focus. Focus said, "Sure, we're in." Uh, so with, with Focus Scientific, with uh, with ourselves and with uh, Fun Fest. We um, contributed towards the uh, the grand prize, and that grand prize itself, had, we had it right outside the planetarium. It was hard to see, but uh, in the last photo, but um, another another big draw. So we had the the ballot box, and people would you know fill in their name and so forth. And uh, here was a photo of the uh, winner there, this uh, Miss, Mrs. Marshall. So it really worked out well. It was a 10-inch daub, so a nice nice prize for a uh, um, for an event like this. So next slide. So. Um, 
lots of very um, talented, very uh, creative people, um, f full of energy. Thank you for, uh, for, for, uh, for doing this, uh, as always. Um, look forward to you coming next year. Okay, um, some of the other things we had going on here, just to pick up the pace a bit, is we did actually have our last uh, uh, star party of the year, public star party of the year. This is an event for those of you who are joining us the first time tonight, where we, uh, our members set up um, uh, their telescopes. Um, in, uh, in, in this case here, it's in, uh, in, in CARP, and, and just outside of the uh, CARP uh, Public Library, uh, right adjacent to the Diefenbunker site, and we allow our um, folks to uh, peek through our telescopes. It's a free event. And uh, what struck me about this event here was, um, well, first of all, we had a string of uh, rained out events, so I was keeping my fingers crossed here that this one would proceed. Um, Stephen McDonald made the call on it, uh, not McDonald, um, McIntyre made the call on it, and, um, and, um, and uh, I think I'm gonna get him to do the calls going forward here because uh, with, with his decision, it, it, uh, it turned out to be clear skies. But what, anyway, what was really nice about this event here was we had uh, 25 telescopes. And I'm, I would put up normally a slide here saying, um, saying uh, you know, thank you for, uh, you know, for all those folks who joined. But I don't even know half the people. So I think that's great that we have uh, lots of new people that are, are joining us. They're, everyone is welcome you know, to bring your telescope to these events here and, and lots of, um, lots of uh, fun. Attila, your, your, uh, your, your view of the, the veil was spectacular through your 25 inch. I still remember it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, another, a couple other things we had recently. Um, Brian McCullough uh, helped or organize an, a, a, uh, an event at Linden, Linden Lea, if I'm pronouncing that right, Linden Lea, uh, Linden Lea um, Community Center. It, this is a, um, a community center in Rockcliffe, and um, there was two portions to it. There was a, a presentation portion on, on a Friday, and uh, because of a, a, a bad weather, there was a, um, a stargazing portion, uh, courtesy of uh, Richard McDonald, Wayne Ross, on the Saturday. Um, again, uh, some pretty good crowds, and uh, this was actually promoted by the, the, um, the uh, organizer, but uh, as usual, Brian, Brian McCullough's events are always well done. Okay, he's always well organized, well executed, and people, are, I think it's a real privilege for people to uh, participate with, um, in an event with uh, Brian organizes. So thank you, Brian. Next slide. Um, just last night, uh, uh, Jeff, or not last night, a, a couple of nights ago, uh, Jeff Cohill uh, did a, um, went to uh, the uh, Oak Park Retirement Home, uh, that's near Chio, and um, and deliver to a, a crowd. He, there was a, a, a presentation and uh, and some um, and some uh, astronomy videos uh, that went over well too. Well, thanks, Jeff. Next slide. Uh, okay, so what's coming up? A couple of events are coming up. Um, we have, uh, in fact, uh, so so many events are coming up that I, I ha my slides are, are not even up to date since I sent them out a couple of days ago to uh, to uh, Chris and uh, eh, eh. so. Um, the first one is that uh, here's, one of the, here's one school outreach event. We've been approached by uh, St. Gregory's uh, Catholic School. Um, they've asked us to come deliver a presentation. We pitched the idea of solar observing. They're interested. Um, Sylvie has, uh, has uh, sort of raised her hand and said uh, she'd love to do the presentation. I am looking for someone who can um, d uh, you know, uh, bring their solar equipment and uh, so that we can offer solar observing. So if anyone is available, and, and the date is negotiable here, I said, you know, or we, we, can, uh, if, if we can please work with uh, Sylvie and we can set a date. Uh, tentatively, we're thinking maybe, uh, uh, I think it was the end of next week. But uh, again, uh, we can, um, it can be, uh, um, you can set a date that suits, you, that suits, you, that suits your needs. So please, if there's someone who's available with uh, solar equipment during the daytime, uh, obviously, um, that would be great. And so, see uh, Sylvie and, and myself. So. Next slide. Uh, another event that's coming up, again, uh, organized by uh, Brian here, and uh, I understand we have enough volunteers now for this event here, is, uh, is the HMIRC, the um, Hazardous Materials, et cetera. And uh, this is a downtown event here. It's part of a, uh, it's a United Way event. Um, again, it's turning into a, a huge event, and they're very excited about us coming. Um, Oh, uh, it's uh, both a presentation and, and, and activities, and also uh, it's a the solar observing uh, weather permitting will be on um, a rooftop uh, downtown. So uh, lots of volunteers there, lots of interest and so forth. Um, this should be really good. Next slide. Uh, another event, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau. This is uh, one that's organized by uh, Eunice and Eric Kujela. Uh, um, I went to the one last year with Eric, and boy, Eric is a terrific uh, presenter, and he's, he, he really knows how to put together some, uh, some, uh, some videos. So um, we are looking for some, um, some people with telescopes for, star for stargazing. This is an event coming up in um, just uh, a couple of weeks, two weeks, I believe. And if you are available, uh, that'd be really great if you could give Eric, Eric a hand and, jo and join Eric, because um, 
and, and actually, it's really interesting, as I said, to see what Eric uh, offers, because he, uh, he's got quite the video show. Uh, all right, so please, if there's uh, something that's available, let me know. Okay, to, to a couple other things. Uh, the winter solstice, um, the museum has approached us and they've, in their annual event that they ask us to uh, participate in, or one of the event, annual events is the uh, winter solstice, December 21st, obviously. Uh, they've asked us for, uh, uh, for, for two things, uh, uh, outdoor um, stargazing, uh, public uh, stargazing. So they're looking for actually six volunteers with um, telescopes. And uh, they're, they're, this year also, they've agreed to set up an uh, indoor exhibit as well. So if it's cool, we can cycle people uh, from indoors to outdoors and so, and so forth. But by the way, last year, Jeff, and, um, Cohen and myself had a, uh, it was minus, well, tw I think it was minus 25. It was bloody oh, cold. It was unbelievable. So I thought they were going to cancel the event. I thought, well, you know what? There must have been two, three dozen people that showed up. So here, at Jet, I, I dressed for the event. I, I looked like a, a penguin, you know. You know, and uh, we did have our telescopes there. We we're looking at—I don't even remember what we we're looking at. But um, there were people that showed up, and and they were excited, and they were full of passion. So this was uh, this, this was something. Another thing that uh, the museum has asked us about is that uh, there's a, um, a lunar eclipse uh, in the morning of, uh, or that uh, that night, or the following morning of. Um, the, uh, the, 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 20, the 22nd, I guess, in the morning. So they've asked us, they said, is there somebody who's interested in joining them for a, um, to set up a telescope on that, uh, on that morning? So if you're interested and uh, you like to stay up late, um, please, please let me know. Actually, I'd, I'd really like if you could appreciate it if you let me know um, uh, soon. And uh, next slide, that might be it. Oh, yeah. Um, so you can see here that there's, there's an awful lot going on in um, a lot of fun, in fact, a lot going on in the uh, outreach program. The outreach program has grown to the, to the point that um, I, I really need, uh, I need help. And um, I enjoy it immensely. It's, almost, it's, like, it's like Christmas Eve every day of the, of the year with outreach. It's just a tremendous amount of fun. Um, I'd like to, to do more, and I'd like to do it, you know, I mean, and I'd like to um, really take it to the next level here. Uh, Chuck O'Dale has offered to, to help drive the, um, the uh, Fun Fest next year. That's great. But there's lots of other opportunities where, if if we specialize a bit, we can. Uh, I think we can. Uh, we can. Um, we can go forward even even better here. So I'm I'm, I'm looking for someone that could help drive the Carp Star parties. Um, I've learned a, a a lot about how to organize them and so forth. I really like to have somebody to help help in that area though. So if you're if you're uh, if you're uh, willing and interested, I can t I can walk you through the process that I, I go through and so forth. And I really appreciate help. School outreach is turning out to be a a massive. Um, and welcome undertaking. There's lots of groups that are approaching us, and I think we can go much further with that. Um, of course, uh, community groups and so forth. Uh, the, um, what's new this year is we have a budget for uh, outreach, and in fact, a significant, a, a very large budget. And one of the things I want to do here is, is, that, is really uh, take, um, develop our exhibits or uh, uh, replace some of our aging exhibits, uh, develop new ones here. So uh, looking for someone who's, uh, you know, who's, got, who's, 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 who's much more creative than me, who can um, help design some of our new ex exhibits. So if this is an area of interest for you, um, that would be terrific. And, and some of the other things I'd like to do, particularly in the wintertime, is, um, is uh, something like mall outreach. I've uh, sent some notes out to Bayshore and to Salaral Center just to see if they'd allow us to uh, do exhibits during the wintertime so we could generate interest for our you know, spring, summer, and fall ev events. Uh, that, that, would be, uh, that would be great. Um, so I mention all this because I, um, I, I look at our center and, and I, I really feel that we have some, ex some very, we have one of the strongest centers with some of the some tremendous talent here. And, you know, I think if, um, I, I bet that there's a story behind why you've all come tonight, or, you know, and, and I think that story started probably many, many years ago where, um, where maybe your interest in astronomy was sparked by somebody maybe it, or uh, or some event maybe it might have been somebody maybe it might have been in a, in a, a peeking through a telescope at a in cottage country or or listening to a presentation or having somebody come to a school and and um and cap and, and capturing your interest in astronomy i'm asking that uh, you you sort of you continue that uh, that tradition and and, and uh and further that legacy and and uh and and help help um help generate interest uh, to our to an, another generation because I think there's a lot that we can offer here, particularly in the Ottawa Centre, where there's just so much to offer. So I think that's it, everyone. Thanks very much. Thanks. Okay, first of all, the library will be open this time. And I'm asking people to check their 
black holes under the bed and other places. And if you have a library book that you have had for more than two months, would you please return it so other people can use it? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Estelle. Um, I'd also like to know whose bottle of orange juice this is. <laughs> anyway, uh, next please, Attila. Uh, just a reminder, uh, the calendars are for sale. I don't think there's a heck of a lot of them left, so I'd recommend if you uh, want to get some for gifts or otherwise, you probably need to go see Mike uh, right away. Uh, next after that, a uh, reminder about the meeting tickets. Uh, already spoke to you once. I think Al is still here. He may have a few tickets left. Are there any left, Al? Oh, okay. I, I have one, but just wondering. Okay, next, Attila. Uh, the usual for post-meeting, as Estelle says, the uh, library is open tonight. Take advantage of it. Uh, we see that once in a while. Uh, equipment library, I imagine, since Al's here, it's probably open. Coffee and conversation, Art and Anne, out, uh, outside. Uh, hopefully we're not so late that they... Uh, uh, will have gone home. <laughs> you can see Al about RASC membership info and cards out there. Uh, they're not being put in the astronauts anymore. You can see that the pile of astronauts is shrinking as people go to electronic and there's less and less of them printed. However, they're getting thicker, so it actually costs about as much as it used to. But anyway, we're working on that. Stephen McIntyre, a uh, person to see about renewals, uh, cut rate on astronomy magazines. Please remember the rest of the museum is closed. Uh, don't wander off into the rest of the museum. Stick to the lobby and the washrooms, please. And uh, the usual reservation has been made over at Kelsey's. Uh, so you can pop over for drinks, dinner, whatever you're interested in. Thank you all. Uh, thanks to the 129 of you who I wouldn't say are still here, but 129 attendants tonight, thanks to the organizers and speakers uh, tonight. I hope the list is complete. Thanks to our host, the Canadian Science and Technology Museum. Please note, those of you who plan to email me, the email address is different now, uh, bill.meeting.chair at gmail.com. Hopefully that's not a terribly hard one to remember. Okay. Uh, Next meeting, 8 o'clock, Friday, December 3rd. So the first Friday of December. Uh, you'll remember it is the AGM, and there will be some business stuff at the beginning before we get into the talks. Pardon me? Uh, is it swap table? I can never remember these things. All right, I'll take Gary's word for it. It's uh, swap table time next time as well. So if you have any goodies to get rid of, bring them on down. Have a safe drive home, please. Thank you.